think we can get started. Um, well, hi, Miriam. Great to see you. Thank you for being here and for joining this conference and this conversation. My pleasure. Um, maybe I'll start by giving a, a very, very brief introduction and then can, can just kind of let you take it away. And then I think what we will be doing today, just so the audience is aware, is I think that Miriam will be giving uh, a little short talk, giving a little bit of context. Um, and then we'll have a video. Unfortunately, our other speaker, Lucy Benali, was not able to make it and there was a bit of a technical difficulty. So we have her recorded. So we will be able to share a recording, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then we can go a little bit deeper uh, with some support from Miriam. We can go into Q&A and all of that from there. So great. So maybe the first thing I'll say super briefly, I mean, Miriam, you've had You've worn many different hats throughout your life and career. <laughs> you've done a lot of different things. I know that you've been a soil biologist. I think that there's a, there's one of the online bios that says you had a semi-feral childhood, which I really appreciate. <laughs> and I know that now you're uh, associated both with the River Sticks Foundation and with Indigenous Parity Conservation Initiative. Um, today, we'll be speaking primarily about ICPI, or IPCI, excuse me, the Indigenous Parity Conservation Initiative and those projects. Um, mm -hmm. and we'll kind of go a little bit into that. Please feel free to, to share whatever it is that, that you'd like to start us off with. Great. Um, yeah, so um, as Izzy mentioned, I'm the co-director of the River Sticks Foundation, and I'm also the interim director of the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative. And it strikes me that um, much of the conversations I've seen today have been around um, what does good allyship look like? And um, being a white director of an indigenous led organization um, has taught me a lot about that. And um, so I can share some about that as well. Uh, I want to first just introduce this uh, incredible project. I'm going to share a little bit about what it is and also some of the history of how it was formed and um, some of the head for the organization. Um, as many of you know, peyote is a vulnerable place and certainly in the United States and its native habitat, that is very true. It has a lot of different pressures. Um, um, so I'm going to read for you the mission, purpose, and vision of the Indigenous Peyote Conservation Initiative. Um, empower Indigenous communities to reconnect with, regenerate, and conserve their sacred peyote medicine for generations to come. This effort is a conservation effort which exists to sustain the spiritual practices of Indigenous peyote promoting health, well-being, and native revitalization through sovereignty, sustainability of the sacred peyote plant, and the those. And I think this is a key uh, concept for all of us who are interested in supporting indigenous communities is that when we're looking at these um, medicines, um, these are biocultural entities. They don't exist um, just as a plant. Um, on their own, uh, in a land, in a native setting, um, in a culture, um, or many cultures that are deeply entwined with the medicine itself. And so when we say, in, in the case of this organization, Indigenous Peyote Conservation, we're not just talking about the conservation, a part of that. We're not just talking about the conservation, we're talking about the conservation of a way of life and of um, many, many different peoples, groups of peoples. Um, this initiative is a land-based initiative that directly addresses the ecological, cultural, and access issues that are related to sustainability of the peyote. Um, it, the project first biocultural strategies for spiritual reconnection, restoration of peyote. This includes land access, stewardship, education, cultivation, a system of harvest and distribution that is spiritually and culturally sound and laid out and developed by its indigenous spiritual leadership. 
it's an international collaborative. It's designed to support um, tribe sustainability and indigenous across um, uh, the United States, Mexico. Um, always work in process. Um, so, where did this come from? In, in about 2012, um, one of the largest Native American churches, which is called the Native American Church of America, um, noticed that a lot of the medicine that they were getting when they were going down to the gardens and purchasing it from Payateros, Payateros are the people who have licenses from DEA and from the Texas government to be able to um, harvest and sell peyote. And this is a newer system of access, right? They were noticing that their they were less, and there was a lot of concern. Um, at that time, they commissioned a study um, that was conducted through the Native American Fund and the Walker Research Group and some other folks that showed in indeed there was serious decline due to pressures from agriculture, land management poaching, improper harvest, um, oils. Um, uh, and so they then it's called the Council of Native American Churches. And this is a, uh, an alliance of the president of the largest Native American churches. And all Native American church members, but it represents um, some of the largest groups that have the most chapters. Um, and they um, conducted what needed to be done. And there were a number that came out of that study, but one of them was that the Native American Church and ABN, which is um, the Diné group, needed to have a land base in the garden to seriously take on um, doing their own conservation and figuring out how to reconnect themselves with the life cycle of the plant and to take sovereignty and responsibility for ensuring the health of their medicine and its populations and their future generations that were going to rely on it. So through a series of meetings, the National Council decided that they needed a non-church organization that would be formed that was just about conservation and it could be utilized by all peyote people. And it was just formed in 2017. Um, the way the um, the leaders talk about it now, it's a baby. It's just getting its feet. It's um, uh, it's very new. We're figuring a lot of things out. Um, in 2017, they asked if I would um, serve as interim director, and because of my an ecologist and working on really complex water issues, um, background in soils, I agreed stay on essentially as being a facilitator to help them develop their strategies. Um, at that time in 2017, um, we also, and River Sticks gave the donation, um, the conservation organization to purchase 605 acres. They developed a spiritual home site that's in the gardens that's actually very abundant um, in the medicine. Um, but it's not a place for harvest. It's a place for people to come and live down in the gardens. So we've developed bathhouses for men and for women. Um, there's a conservation house. Um, it's really a spiritual home site that serves as a hub. That's um, why we couldn't get Lucy on. She's out in the field. She's on pilgrimage right now. And um, you'll be able to see her talk about that a little bit in a moment. Um, but also on that family education, um, spiritual education, and also how to harvest properly um, for connecting with ranchers and create access so that people can actually begin doing their own harvests. And harvested medicine rather than really Payotero system, which is really more defined by DEA, um, you know, the way that peyote is defined by the government, which isn't really how the peyote people define it. Um, so we're doing a lot of rancher relations, assessments on lands. Um, the harvest that just happened, they went out and harvested. They recorded how many medicines they took. Um, they will be able to come back in four years and replant in that same place two medicines. 
that they took. We are developing a culturally appropriate um, that took three and a half years to design that takes into account um, many of the different um, cultures that are involved. You know, sometimes people think, oh, it's Native American church, it's all one culture. We're working with over 40 different tribes and they all have different ways of doing things. Um, developing a program where we region we're beginning that in Oklahoma um, and then in Arizona where there'll be conservationists back at home who can really do education around conserving and organize the pilgrimages for people to do um, ecological and spiritual harvest. Um, another strategy is to continue to build unity and indigenous people in order to protect their medicine. You can imagine that's very delicate work and there's um, a lot work that happens even though everybody's um, so that's kind of a um, really brief overview of um, where the project's at and the um, and the work that's happening we're gonna uh, show this video um, from Lucy um, who is um, Lucy Benali is one of the um, members of ABNDN which is the biggest nay um, church um, she has been involved in since its inception, also a youth educator and has been really instrumental in starting to do education within the Diné around um, connecting in a spiritual and good way to their um, medicine. And um, so, Izzy, we can probably roll the video of um, Lucy now. Great, I think we're getting tech support to help to do that. Hi, Karen, thank you so much for helping us out with this. Thank you for that intro, Miriam, super appreciated. And for the guests, we'll, we'll go a little bit more into these details shortly as well. Okay, great, we got the video. Ready when Oops. Karen, it was up and then it just went back down. And we're up again. Great. Yeah, hey, Lucy Benali in the Shia. Hello, my name is Lucy Benali. I am a Dene woman from the Navajo, from the Navajo Reservation. I live in a small community um, called Sweetwater, Arizona. I am a mother of three children and also a grandmother of three grandchildren. Um, my clans, usually we introduce ourselves in Navajo. My clans are Edgewater, Habaha, Salt Clan, Ashihe are my, my father's clan. My grand, my grandfather, uh red running into the water, and my Paternal clan is the Tani, the folded arm people. Um, usually, as a Dene woman, that is how we introduce ourselves. So, my topic is um, a grandmother's prayer. So, uh, with the first slide, we see a grandmother there. Um, she is Salt Clan. I first met grandma on the AB Indian Chikaya land in texas it was the first year my husband um became uh president for the ab indian and we have over um six thousand members um some very active some not but a lot of them make this pilgrimage down to texas every april so right now that is where i am at with my family my husband so we have made this pilgrimage and we did not see grandma this year we seen her every year 2014 to 2017 uh, here she had dementia and her children were just had but this year was 2014 where she was there and she was sitting on a mattress under a shade and on the mattress she has her medicine out 
And the question is, what is she keeping sacred? What is her prayer? What is her dream for her children and grandchildren? As she's sitting there um, out in the desert with her medicine. And what was she thinking when she made the pilgrimage of over 1,200 miles one away? So that is the question. What is grandmother's prayer? Well, as the Neh women, uh, our children, are, uh, we're a matrilineal society, so our children, um, we, we focus a lot of our attention, prayers for our children. And um, we want them to live a life that is fulfilling, a life that is balanced and in harmony. And in one way is through spirituality. And so grandma here is that's her prayer that's her thought that's her wish that's her dream that her children will live a life that is in harmony and in balance so that is um when my husband first started with uh, the presidency um so the reason why she's sitting there with her medicine is that there are a lot of um, um, laws, federal laws or legislations, um, the DEA that have set parameters uh, and a classified peyote as a controlled substance. So that is one reason it is being controlled. And those are some obstacles that our members face. Um, also, um, the ranchers on, on, in Texas have fenced off their uh, land due to probably some hippie era where there was a lot of poaching and a lot of parting out on their land, and the ranchers um, fenced off their, their land. So she's unable to put her medicine down. She's unable to offer her prayer, offer, make an offering of corn pollen to the medicine and to properly harvest. So she is probably reminiscing the time that she was able to do that and uh, hoping that her children will someday maybe experience what she has experienced. So that is probably her wish, her dream, her prayer. And, and so do many other Navajo women, Diné women that make that trip to Texas. So we have a second slide and there's a difference in the expression of this grandma's face. In 2017, um, through the um, formation of the IPCI and the National Council, um, they were able to uh, purchase a tract of land where there is peyote on land, peyote on site, where we had a chance to send our children out into the natural habitat of where a zay grows. And they were the grandmas, um, grandpas took family out there and they made their offering. And then um, they were also able to go onto land where they harvest um, some azet. Azet means medicine. So uh, the children were able to heart, uh, offer and, and then also harvest medicine with their family. So this grandma, her prayers are answered. So that's grandmother's prayer. And she's probably thinking that, um, that she wants this for her children, for her grandchildren. So with the, 
with the IPCI as a conservation initiative, we um, decided to um, teach the children, teach the children how to properly um, address the medicine, be very respectful, and then how to harvest it the right way, the proper harvesting. So we taught them that. Um, some, some language we also taught them because we want our children to uh, really reconnect. And to reconnect also means to use the language. And um, without the context, without the hands-on, um, we can try and uh, teach our kids this back in Arizona, but it's not going to be real for them. But when we come on site, the 605 land or the ABND in Chikea, we're able to bring them on land where they can experience hands-on um, what, what they're being taught. So that was uh, our first lesson on, on site that we did. So AB and DN formed a youth committee and that's, that's how we taught the children to go out. And then after they were taught, they went out with their grandparents onto a ranch and they were, they were able to um, make offering and then also harvest some of the medicine. And the children really, really liked, liked that. It's something that they've never ever experienced. And the grandparents were so happy that uh, the reconnection was happening. And that is uh, due to the work of IPCI and the National Council. So now this child will forever have this experience and will most likely come back and want to do it again. So that is. Um, that is um, how we uh, educated our children. Then um, the pandemic happened, so we didn't do anything last year. And then just this week or yesterday, um, since school is not the same anymore, not many children came out this year. So there were, oh, at least 15 children that went out to uh, do the offering and then also to harvest some medicine um, this year. Um, so that was uh, something that we want to continue to do as we grow, both AB and DN, uh, uh, or three, AB and DN, the National Council and the IPCI. We would like to continue to add um, these experiences for our children. Um, so um, a conservation is new to our, our um, children because we've gotten away from our traditional way of life. I myself grew up without no running water, no electricity. Um, very little food. So I, uh, I know what it means to conserve. But for our children, I think they need to learn the concept. So right now, um, the way peyote is harvested is just by the peyoteros. And uh, they just go out and they uh, harvest it, they bring it in. So we're just consumers, we go to their um, homes, and we just buy and buy, you know, by the hundreds and bring it back and uh, use it. But now we're teaching them to save the seeds, save the seeds, bring them back next time you come back on land so that we can replant them or reseed them. So that's our prayer now for our children that they will learn how to conserve learn how to start taking care of the land, the, 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 the seeds, the medicine. 
Um, so that is uh, our prayer right now for our children. Um, and the last slide, we, we are looking at 100 years, 100 years for our children. In 100 years, we, as Dene, want our children to carry on this beautiful way of life, this beautiful way of life. We would like for them to carry this on. So right now, these two children would be grandmas and grandpas twice over. We would like for them to have the same experience that we've had right now. So, um, so um, we have to teach them the language. That way it is passed on the right way. And um, also that, um, so IPCI has given us a chance, has given us a chance to re have our children reconnect. And even ourselves as adults, we didn't have that. All we do is we go to the payroll tariffs and buy our medicine. So we ourselves are learning too. So we would like this, this opportunity for our kids. Um, we would like for them to continue to learn more and more. And, um, <coughs> and to um, continue that. So I would like to say that, um, please give our children a chance. Give our children a chance. Respect our medicine, respect our way of life. Um, we know that peyote is on the decline. We would like that for our children. Yes, there's research, there's um, poaching, there's um, other people are interested, um, maybe for recreational purposes, but for us, it is a very sacred medicine. Um, and we would like that to, to continue to be there for our children. So with that, um, we would like um, people to support us in our efforts and be an ally. Um, and that way, I think our medicine will be there for our, our grandchildren. I think that will be my topic sending. Thank you for listening. Um, I hear that means thank you. I'm so glad we were able to get that recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. If she's we. Um, sending, we sending didn't have a computer for, yeah, and didn't do the phone, so. Um, do you have anything you wanted to ask me now? Yeah, I mean, th there's, there's a couple things I'd like to dig a little bit into. Um, maybe the first, I wonder if you could, for our audience who might be a little bit newer to this topic, I wonder if you could demystify the peyote trade process. You've mentioned the DEA, Lucy mentioned the peyoteros. There's a question in the chat around who's selling the, NA, the peyote, where does it come from? Um, so I wonder if you could just mm -hmm. give a brief overview of well, how, what does the regulated religious use of parity trade look like in the U.S. as regulated by the DEA, and how does that flow? Because I think having a sense of that might be helpful for people to understand why having alternative routes of access is important. Yes. So once um, peyote um, started regulated um, by the federal. And DEA and also allowable for federally recognized tribes at the same time. Um, what happened um, 
and there's there's a lot of history and I don't have time to go into, but I can tell you what's happening right now, which is that there um, a system was put in place where you had payateros who got licenses from the this, um, Department of um, Public safety and um, with those licenses they were then allowed to have pickers go out um, and pick medicine bring it back essentially to their homes and then um, they would sell it to Native American church and ABNDN members or any member of a federally recognized tribe when they came down to the gardens and picked it up and so it basically went from being a pilgrimage where and harvest what was needed for their chapters, um, having particular ceremonies in, in mind, because remember these ceremonies are for healing purposes. And so they'd have particular ceremonies in mind. They would bring them home, bring the medicine home, at the chapters or the families that needed it. Um, once the tarot system went into place, people had to buy their medicine sold in thousands. Um, from the Pateros and it brought money into the relationship, which then, of course, Pateros wanted to be able to make money. It really changed the whole um, relationship to the gardens for Native American church people. Um, what happened over the 45, 50 years um, that began is that the Pateros have got, had to go farther afield. They're um, harvesting smaller medicines. Um, the peyote takes a long time to mature. It's a very growing plant. Depending on how much water it gets, it can take anywhere from eight to 40 years to mature and ready to harvest. So babies were being harvested, essentially babies were being harvested, are being harvested today. Um, and then um, also what started to happen is some ranchers um, didn't like the was being treated by the payateros, and so they started closing down um, access to certain ranches. And so a lot of the impetus behind um, IPCI is to develop direct relationships with landowners, um, have long-term leases, and actually cut out that middle relationship. Um, of course, we want to be able to support you all um, struggling living also so probably will be paying some lease money or people will be contributing lease money but we're looking at really moving money out of the equation and going back to this old way of pilgrimage harvest and then bringing it home um and so there's a lot that ipci has to go through with that because we have these um kind of you know different systems that we're working in we have to satisfy DEA up to a point, but we also have to um, really follow through on the rights of Native Americans to be able to harvest and transport um, their own medicine. So we're kind of working on both fronts. And maybe to go a little bit deeper, so I'll share a super brief anecdote, which is that at the first um, conference, the first conference that of this series was all in Spanish and it was in Mexico, Plantas Sagradas de las Americas. And it was in Ajijic, outside of Guadalajara, three years ago. Um, and uh, I, I, sh I remember showing up uh, with my talk. It was the first time I was giving a talk in Spanish. It was called uh, La Política de lo Sagrado, The Politics of the Sacred. And I came in really excited to talk about uh, policy and medicine and all these topics that I had been thinking about. And I listened to talks. I'm glad I spoke on one of the last days because in the period of listening to talk, especially from indigenous folks from all over Central and South America and North America, um, I feel like I got very humbled in that process because what I was thinking as like the politics of the sacred was the politics of the medicine, the substance. And what I heard everyone talking about was land. And I ended up changing the name of my topic to the politics of healing, which is still a big topic, but it's a little bit more limited. But just yeah. one of the things that I feel like I've learned as a you know person with interrupted indigenous ancestry who grew up in the West, who's also you know the child of 
uh, immigrants or settlers, depending on who you ask. Um, I think a lot about the politics of land. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the relationship between IPCI and the land, not just, I mean, the land project specifically, but also Lucy went into a bit around, there's this kind of process of reimagining a relationship with the land that became ruptured be partially because of this administrative system that DEA has set up. So I wonder if you could speak a bit to that relationship to the land in any of those pieces. Well, it's that's a, that's a big question. But <laughs> it's I a think, big question. Um, yeah, and it but it's really, really, really important. And I think that um, you know one of the things there's been a kind of um, at least in California with the California decrim. There's all this. There's been this big flurry around. And there's like disagreements about, you know, should it be decriminalized or not being decriminalized? And, you know, um, is there a scientific approach to reestablishing the populations and all of this? And it's all, it's, it's very complex. And, um, <clears throat> and I think that for me as an ally, who's completely as an ecologist, you know, this community right here, we have to be thinking about what we're doing in the context of that we're at a time of climate change. Um, we're in the extinction. We're in a time where many people are disconnected from the land and from the, um, you know, how to live a balanced life that Lucy's praying for her, you know, grandchildren. And um, so, at least in the United States, Native American. And, um, and federally recognized tribes is who we're mostly talking about here, but it's other indigenous indigenous are right now in history. When they look back, they've had land taken away from them for years, um, water, children, language, right? So when you think about um, medicine conservation now in that context you have to think about that part of what we're also doing is this medicine for them is helping address um, all of those concerns and so that's one of the things that i always remember as an ally is that it it is inappropriate for anybody except for the people whose very you know life and culture are relying and completely intertwined with this medicine to um, to make the plan for how to do that reconnection. And in fact, if we could if we could back make space and just be good allies and really, really listen and really be patient in what he was um, the the taking on the responsibility for the conservation of this medicine is actually allowing people in those communities, in the NAC communities, to think through the, all the issues of reconnection to language, reconnection to land, what their relationships with the landowners should be now. I mean, if I could tell you, like, what just happened yesterday, where we had a 15th generation rancher who 100 years ago did it's coming on his land, but because of the Peotero system, he stopped that and had it to happen and yesterday I had a conversation with him in the evening and he was crying like for 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 people who have land whatever you know however they got it and all of that this is really sacred and special and so these relationships uh, and there's many many layers to it around reconnecting to land and it may be that we need to buy a lot more land um, we're maybe that we're looking at um, conservation events that are actually about being sacred access to medicines. So, anyways, that was a way of just saying unequivocally it's related to land access. And it's also related to land is really powerful. And that's why having a spiritual home site as a hub where people can directly connect with the um, that natural environment and be directly with the medicine, have a home there where they're comfortable with themselves, where they're just not pressure, all of that. That's actually the structure or the um, the home base that allows ethic and strategies to emerge. And so pieces extremely crucial 
and we're talking, you know, most of the, most of the tribes don't, this was a place they would come to, not a place where they lived, right? So it's, it's really, really important because then you start getting into, well, private land ownership, you know, what is that doing to like access to a spiritual and ecological biocultural entity? It really gets in way. But how can we now today make relationships that are really beautiful with, you know, the ranchers and the landowners and a, a sort of a network of ownership and, and um, leasing? Yeah. So. Speaking of kind of, uh, yeah, the, the reality of private property and the, the lines that are drawn by these things, I think there was a really good question in the chat from Veronica Gonzalez around, if you know anything about records of exchange between Native Americans and indigenous folks in Mexico who are also using peyote, and if, if there has been historically any exchange around peyote and what the relationship is like now. Hmm. Well, um, I mean, I think that, you know, our border between the United States and Mexico is a false Right? And we know that people were passing back and forth across the Rio Grande for um, millennia. Um, I just spoke with somebody who's an um, uh, archaeologist recently who is looking at um, cave drawings um, yeah. in South Texas where people would mark when they passed through. And there are many, many tribes that were um, going back and forth across the um, Rio Grande. And if you look at the history of the Native American church, um, the early exchanges um, were between um, people who mostly lived north of the Rio Grande but traveled down south and, um, and people who lived south of the Rio Grande. You know, you can read about um, place. Um, <clears throat> you know, the person who's kind of like the Johnny Apples the Native American church was a um, Comanche, Juana Parker. Um, and I think today, uh, it's almost like a topic for a whole panel, but um, people who are on um, the board of IPCI have spent time in Mexico things with um, Veratica people. Um, in 2010, um, the Native American Church of North America wrote a statement in solidarity in the protection of Wirikuta. Um, there's been other, um, you know, um, bits of unity. There's certainly been common prayers, um, and there's certainly yeah. common. I think that um, the decrim movement and how it began, and because it got so um, complex around peyote, actually caused a lot of disruption. It caused a lot of, a lot of peyote communities, um, uh, certainly in the United States, and then in any kind of a, you know, sort of the Rio Grande, um, because you know, it's sort of these these internal to indigenous people processes are very delicate and and then there was all this kind of external um uh i'll just be perspective noise and disrespect um and and not just that it was disrespectful there was a lot of concern and fear was um was brought up in the indigenous communities and so that kind of, I think, slowed some of the unity down and got people more, you know, into their um, individuals. Yeah, but like you said, this could totally be its own whole panel and I wish we had a lot more time. We've only got another minute or so and maybe just to close, I wonder if, um, as you've said repeatedly, this is a very complex political, cultural, social issue. And I wonder if there's any just misconceptions or think kind of things about IPCI that you really want to like leave the audience with, that you want to be clear on like how IPCI has approached this work and how you see this going forward over the next however many years. Mm. 
Well, I think that, um, you know, in my role as an ally, one of the things that I've learned um, to do is to listen and be patient. And I personally think that the peyote conservation undertaken by Native American people, at least, in, you know, in this country and, you know, Mexico and Canada as well, is one of the unequivocally most important uh, things to get behind supporting. And a lot of what that means is um, allowing the indigenous leadership to set the strategy on a, you know, the, um, on the conservation and then be supportive. And that means like on the legal front, it means on the technical front, it means on the land access front, it means on the cultural front, it means on all fronts. And, um, and so, you know, I would say that that's all IPCI is about. And I'm in a lot of conversations with IPCI leadership, and it's really just all about um, that years that um, Lucy talked about um, is the main conversation. What needs to happen? What is the prayer? You know, you could call it an initiative, but mostly what I hear people say is, what is the prayer that will take us to, in a hundred years, the medicine is threatened and it's easily accessible by the people who need it for their way of life. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Miriam, for joining us. Thank you again so much to the watchers for joining this Sunday evening. I'm Ismail Ali, really glad to be having this conversation. Thank you to Lucy, wherever she is. Um, and thank you everyone for the really good questions. Obviously this is a huge conversation and we'll keep having it for at least the next you know, few years, or decades, hopefully the next hundred years. So thank you again. Yeah, and if there's, yeah, and if there's questions, I'm happy to answer them. I don't know how this works with the, um, with the, the, um, the format, but I'm happy to do that if people would like. I think that there's a connection room that people can join you in uh, if you wish. And I think that if people want to figure out another way to connect um, there's kind of like this little networking tab on the side where people can get each other's information and jump in. So I would maybe encourage you to join that little networking tab on the side over here, um, saying to the people in the chat, I've got to jump because I'm moderating our next session. Uh, so I'll see you shortly. Connection room, there you go, that's what it's called. Check out the connection room. Thank you all for joining. Have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>